I'm here to, uh, as uh, Chuck suggested, uh, Southern Hampshire University sounds like the name of a public institution. It's actually a private school, a private institution. I'm not sure what the hell they were thinking when they named it as such. Um, <laughs> that's a correct the record all the time. But, uh, but we're about 6,500 students, um, two-thirds of those evening, weekend, and online programs, the preferred provider for the U.S. Navy and also part of ERMU, our fastest growing uh, business is our online uh, area, and that's growing rapidly. So that just gives you a little bit of context before I go into my, into my comments. It's been a remarkable 10 years. I was struck by Alan's comment about how good journalism had it up until about three years ago, and then the fall was precipitous. Uh, higher ed, private higher education has had a remarkable run of 10 years. If you think about it, we had a building boom, low cost of capital, a society that certainly has had more demand, a more pronounced demand for education than ever before, richer array of programs available to our students, the a really uh, dramatic introduction of technology, our endowments were up. I'd take those 10 years again, maybe not the last not of, last of, the, of the 10, but the first nine I would take again in a, in a moment. But I think that sense of well-being masked uh, a lot of other dynamics that sort of coalesce around access and affordability. In reality, and Bill Gray's piece was terrific that uh, Nancy sent out beforehand, we know state subsidies were going down. We saw lagging federal support, higher cost of private debt, which I think is one of the pieces we don't talk enough about when we talk about student indebtedness, which is the sacrifice that families are making, the ways in which they are, in many cases, mortgaging their retirements. Um, hidden cost to families, as I'm suggesting, and then costs going up. So I heard a presentation from somebody from Moody's last week that predicts they'll see 100 closures in the next two years of private institutions or independent institutions. And we know that students are being turned away on both the public and private side. I think there are a number of sort of misalignments, if you will, if, you'll, if I can use that phrase, in the public debate that's underway right now. Because when, uh, when we talk about this sort of public policy debate, um, so often now it seems to cohere around this goal of 60% of students, of adults, as degree holders by 2025. And we keep hearing the word productivity. Um, higher education engages in that discussion with a different agenda quite often. In reality, um, we are more complex organizations and a lot of the work we love to do isn't really about degree and completion rates. Um, we build magnificent campuses. I'm going to spend $16 million this year on a brand new dining hall, which will not increase the quality of education one whit. Well, Alma tells me I can leverage it a little bit as a place for learning, and she makes me sleep better at night. Um, faculty cares a lot about scholarship and research. The public cares very little about much of it. Um, the, uh, we have sports, and the alumni of institutions care about their particular teams and the teams that they love to beat, but in reality, we spend a lot of money on sports. Um, we create a bubble for students in terms of food courts and climbing walls and multi-million dollar fitness centers and single rooms and residence halls. BU spent, uh, as you know, $111,000 per bed on a high-rise uh, dormitory in Charles River a few years ago. And our faculty continue to push for the disciplinary health of their areas of pursuit uh, much uh, increasing the, uh, the cost to the institution. I was not a popular guy last year when I told our School of Business that we decided after a lot of analysis that we would not pursue AACSB accreditation for the business school uh, because I knew that that would then cost me $150,000 a year to sign a marketing, newly minted PhD in marketing and with a reduced teaching load and with a signing bonus, only to have Northeastern, my buddy Tom Moore, the dean over there, steal them away after a year or two as they move up the food chain. Um, and with debates in uh, accounting, we have a very large account program accountancy in our state, with debates about uh, requiring 150 credit hours. I'm not sure an undergraduate accounting major needs 150 credit hours. Um, but again, pushing the cost. So you have the faculty really sort of in a different discussion around what the priorities should be, and really not very much pulled into this question of graduation rates. So the flush years, I think, hid or allowed a lot of this other stuff to happen, driving up cost and really sort of delaying the discussion that we're having today. I think that the discussion when we do turn to the question of cost and access tends to be oversimplistic. Um, we are seeing, for example, uh, emerge from our public schools woefully underprepared students with an explosion of developmental courses, which are expensive and necessary. The number one selling textbook in American higher education last year was called Becoming a Master Student. It's a, basically a guide to basic study skills, note-taking skills, how to read a textbook. Um, that tells you something. We don't like to talk about the way that higher ed in America is a sorting system, but I think, and we had a little bit of discussion, forgive me for those who were in the health pol uh, discussion with Joanne, that there is at least a public policy consensus in America, I think, 
of a baseline level of, of sort of objective for public health, that everyone should be, have uh, good public health available to them, and we, and we sort of know what that means, even though we know there are huge disparities. I'm not sure in higher education we agree on the baseline expectations for students. I think a lot of the people engaged in the public policy debate have no problem with underfunded community colleges. That's fine. If that's sort of where they're, that's where the sorting system sends them. And as someone pointed out in the discussion at lunch, we spend an inordinate amount of resources on the most well-prepared, uh, um, well-supported uh, students uh, in our Ivy Leagues, for example, in our NESCAC schools. And those kids would be successes if you sent them anywhere. Um, and, and, and so I always joke with my colleagues at Harvard, they get the easiest job in higher ed. Um, I um, uh, saw a presentation last week from ACT on uh, workforce. Yes. And um, interesting observation in this is that we are, in, they would argue that we are, as you project through 2015, doing a pretty good job of matching supply with demand on high-end jobs. The reality, education is providing what we need, by and large, on the high end. That where we're falling behind is on the middle end, and that that gap is going to widen tremendously, and what they would call low-level skill jobs are going to shrink. So that middle level is what they're calling equivalent to, if not two years of higher education. Uh, it's the sweet spot for the community colleges, the least uh, well-funded part of the higher ed system, though there seems to be, and Eduardo will talk about this, at least some hope for some shifts in all of that. Um, that's the part of the market, by the way, that is the sweet spot for the not-for-profits. They're, they're in this economic crisis enjoying tremendous growth, as you might know, and that's where they target. That's, that's sort of where most, despite the MBA programs, that's most of what, uh, where they'll be spending their time. And I think the other part of this, and get to uh, the question of technology, which is a lot of where our work is going on, I don't think we're being um, forthright, those of us who advocate for a dramatic and different integration of technology about the degree to which faculty roles will be uh, greatly changed. In fact, I think faculty will be largely displaced. And that's an uncomfortable thing to have a conversation. I'm not going to say that on my campus, and I assume what said in this room stays in this room, Nancy. Um, but I think, uh, I think that is likely to be the case, a very, very different role. Um, we're seeing interesting discussion about what counts for education. And I think this is likely to change dramatically over the next stretch of time. So uh, prior learning assessment, which looks at uh, ways to create, so address competency-based evaluations of what you know and have that count in the world of credit, the currency of the realm. And you may know that Kaplan is working with another for-profit on um, doing a commercial PLA process that they would argue could then carry credit. Um, the movement towards competency-based uh, education shifts the locus of uh, achievement from the teacher to the fac from the faculty member to some other method quite often. And I think that's where that displacement starts. And what we'll then see is a shift away from seat time as a definition of achievement. Classroom time matters less in that world, and this opens up huge possibilities. And I think that's going to be one of the things that we'll uh, look at. Uh, so at my institution, let me talk a little bit about some specific things we've done. Nancy urged me to stop pontificating about big things and get to the practical things in the trenches, as Chuck says. I think that's how I heard it, though, Nancy. No, <laughs> um, a program that's getting a lot of attention. We've tried a couple things. One is the Advantage program. The Advantage program uh, we launched this year as a pilot program. Um, we've been talking a lot uh, about what would it mean to offer the essential undergraduate experience at SNHU stripped of all of those other things I alluded to, climbing walls, fitness centers, expensive dining halls, living on campus, sports, student organizations. Um, and we, we launched at two of our satellite sites, and instead of the $35,000 a year cost, students in this program live at home. Uh, they pay $10,000 flat fee for the year. It's for the first two years of their schooling, so it saves them 60% of the cost of education in those two years. And um, this was picked up by a lot. It's interesting. We, we talked about this a year ago and couldn't get anybody's attention. When we launched it this year in the midst of a financial crisis, it was picked up by the AP and papers all over the country. And then Richard Schieffer and CBS Evening News came up and spent two days interviewing students and sitting in on classes and did a story. Um, and Schieffer came up with a narrative in his head. And the narrative was, in these difficult economic times, isn't it awful how these students get a much lesser stripped down version of education, uh, even though it's, it's costing them less? What he found, to his surprise, was that the students in the program really had a different set of values at work. They actually talked about, and in the interviews, I should have brought the clip, talked about how 
they really didn't want the distractions of living on campus. They really weren't interested in the climbing wall and joining organizations. That really, they're very goal-directed. All their classes are in the morning because all of them work in the afternoon or in the evening. And, and that this worked for them really well. We're going to double the size of that program this year and roll it out at two other satellite centers. So we'll continue and we'll watch it closely and see how it goes. Interestingly, one of those centers is only 25 minutes away from the main campus and for $150, any of the students in the program can sign on and have access to all of this other stuff. Not a single student in the program out of the first 37 in the pilot have done so. Um, and, and again, Schieffer asked about this. So he came away sort of thinking there is another cohort, and that's the question, of course, different cohorts of students who wanted something else. And what they get is small classes, a lot of full-time faculty attention, a lot of academic support, and the core education. Um, but everything else is, 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 is stripped away from that. We offer, uh, 13 years ago, FIPSI gave us a grant to look at competency-based business education in a three-year model. And there's a lot of discussion now, as you know, about three-year models. We feel like we've been doing it for a long time, and it met with um, the folks at the Department of Education, Arnie Duncan, to start to talk about our program a little bit. We've done this for 13 years. We have a lot of data collected. Um, tremendous success. First to second year retention rates of 91%, an 87% uh, four-year retention rate versus a national retention rate of 45% over six years. Students are saving 25% on the cost of their undergraduate education. And we did it in six semesters by shifting to a dramatically um, reconstructed or re-engineered curricular model. So this is not, as some people have done, simply stuffing four into three or adding summer or interterm sessions. This is a lot more interdisciplinary pro courses, uh, capstone program, uh, programs in each semester, uh, teamwork, um, really a very interesting model that students love and I think has been a tremendous success for us. And then um, the third area that I think we're doing, so I think some interesting work is with online. Um, our institution's about $115 million a year. <clears throat> Excuse me. The um, online part of that is about $17 million, though it yields a $7 million surplus and really is the, so it provides the surplus for the institution. By the way, in the midst of this fiscal crisis uh, this past fall, S&P upgraded our credit rating um, after we ran a surplus for the 10th year in a row and a, and a healthy one at that. Um, our intent is to take that online program from its current 17 to 40 in three years and to 100 million, essentially doubling the size of the university in six years. And to do that, we are really tearing up the page in terms of how we do a lot of what we do operationally and looking hard at the for-profit. So all our benchmarking now is against the for-profit sector on the operation side. We're trying not to at all emulate them on the academic provision of programs because I think they do a poor job. You know, we talk about Phoenix, and I think a lot of people sort of valorize, either hate it or valorize and say, we've got to look at and try to be more like them. We want to be more like them in their operations, but they have a 28% graduation rate, and they have all sorts of, uh, I think, sort of poor practice in their, in their recruitment. However, that said, a year ago, uh, we benchmark everything now, and we revisit on an almost daily basis. This required us to take the whole of the online operation, move it off campus to a different location, get some cultural difference. We talk about how do you shift systems. I don't think you can shift systems from within. Um, somebody, I think it was uh, Alan, talked about Skunk Works. Essentially, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar, you used Disruptive today, but Clayton Christensen's work is really the lens we take on this. He sits on our board and has been really helpful in thinking about this work. But, um, now we benchmark everything against the for-profits. I'll give you two examples. A year ago, it took us 90 days to complete an online student's financial application from start to finish. Um, uh, this year, we've got it down to 40. We've shaved 50 days off of that. Our, the uh, average in the for-profit world is 21. Um, in 12 months, we'll be able to give a student a projected answer in an hour. Um, and we'll get the number down to seven days. So that's a, that's a good sort of operational piece. Uh, a year ago, a student um, who clicked on, tell me about the SNHU uh, MBA program, we talked about MBA programs, Eric did, would get an email probably within an hour or two, we'd get a print package through a customer relationship management system probably within five to six days and then might get a phone call depending on how they responded to that. Today if you click on it, you will get a phone call in an average of nine minutes. Um, and we, again, benchmark against our competition, and there they know that the question is our speed to lead. That someone, the consumer mindset of the online student clicking on a number of these programs is only going to have a meaningful conversation with two to three of the people who call them. So the first three are in the game and everybody else is out. Um, so that's really sort of change. And we do that through a call center in Denver. 
Um, our, in our curriculum for the online program, we have moved to the decoupled curricular model that many of you are familiar with that was engineered by the Open University in the 1960s. Uh, but in this case, we bring in subject matter experts. We bring all the content, a very sort of rich repository of content stored in um, learning objects repositories that can be reused and scaled. And um, we don't depend on any single faculty member thus. So when a faculty member leaves, the course doesn't go away. It's scalable. We can ensure quality control. And we have a four-member uh, programming team based in Chennai who builds us applications to look at quality assurance. So for example, we know that the single biggest factor in students' success or happiness with an online course is the amount and kind of interaction they get from their instructor. So they've built us a tool that monitors all of our online courses. And when someone's out of the band, if you will, it flags an academic coordinator who can then go into the course and take a look at what's going on. Sometimes a lack of presence is for good reason. There's a team project going on. The students are interacting. Instructor doesn't need to be there. But you want to be able to make that call. You need to be able to go in and make that judgment. Other cases, either there is a response, but not meaningful response, or no response at all. And it allows us to intervene on that. I think that what we're now playing with are um, faculty-less uh, courses. So no faculty presence, competency-based, assessment-driven. You go through as fast as you like. As soon as you can demonstrate competency in that course, you can move on to the next one. Those are all in sort of the pilot stage right now as we play with those. And they obviously lend themselves to some disciplines and not to others. But that's, those are the sort of things that we're looking at. I think that the advantage we have in the independent side is we can move faster. I think we can do these things um, a little bit easier um, in, in the independent sector. And, and, and that's not to say that not great innovation is happening in the public side. In fact, um, when I worked in the corporate side, when we want to look at innovation, we would go to the League of Innovation Conference, or the Community College Conference, because those are the guys who really got it and really were thinking about productivity and technology in interesting ways. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the locus of good, of good work is still being done. I think it is appalling how little genuine innovation has gone on in higher ed. We talked about practices in healthcare, but if you were to take a look at the effectiveness of teaching in most hallways as you walk down through most classrooms, it would look a lot like it did in 1450. Um, and we were talking about, Joanne was talking about, you know, what is it, 17 years to get a breakthrough medical piece. You know, it took us 25 years to get the overhead projector from the bowling alley to the <laughs> classroom, as Bill has pointed out in other places. Um, it really is appalling. And I think, um, I, I, again, if you read Bill's piece, I think he's absolutely right. It is going to be the integration of technology in pretty radical ways that will allow us to really shift the productivity equation. And if you haven't read Clayton's book um, called Disrupting Class, it's his attempt to apply his, his lens, if you will, on the K-12 world. But I think it speaks pretty eloquently to the challenges that we face at the higher ed level. So thank you.